right, TMC family and friends, open your copy of God's Word and join me today in the book of Romans chapter 8. The book of Romans chapter 8. In the first service, Troy mentioned not only the, the deodorant and the soap and the socks and the underwear, but they also need combs. And I can tell you, uh, Troy and I both still have our combs. Just can't seem to part with it. Oh. So, uh, there we go. So, Romans 8, beginning in verses 31 through 39, as we finish out this chapter in God's Word, as we walk the Romans road together. Follow as I read, <clears throat> beginning in verse 31. It says this, What then shall we say to these things? What are the these things that Paul's referring to? What could be all of the chapters leading up to this, but specifically verses 28 through 30. Now, a few Sundays back we learned about 28 where it says that God works all things together for good to those who love God and those who are called according to His purpose. We learned that God paints on a canvas bigger than we can see. We only see a few of the brush strokes. That God is using the good things, the bad things, the difficult things, the delightful things. He works them together for our good. God's desire is not to destroy us, but to develop us. God wants to use the difficulties in life not to push us from Him, but draw us closer to Him. We learn that everything in life, even the difficult things, if they help us to walk more in faith, causes us to be driven to prayer, to be more dependent upon God, they are ultimately good things. We then progress to verses 29 and 30, which is called the golden chain of salvation. We recognize that God is the one who is completing our salvation. That when God begins a good work in us, He will complete it to the day of salvation. That's all those good things are leading into our greater sanctification, becoming more and more like the Lord. These are the things that Paul's talking about. Verse 31 goes on to say this, For God, <clears throat> for if God is for us, who can be against us? It's a pretty strong statement, amen? <clears throat> if God is for us, who can be against us? Of course, it's a rhetorical question, and the answer is, no one and nothing. If God is for us, nothing and no one can be against us. He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? That's talking about Jesus Christ, His sacrificial death for us. If God was willing to allow His darling Son to die for us, there's no other good thing that God will keep back from us. Now this is not a prosperity doctrine teaching. We recognize that the good things that God is concerned most about is our greatest needs, our spiritual well-being. That God likes to do good things for His kids. That He does provide for us in physical and tangible ways. But those are not the ultimate things. Whenever you have a prosperity gospel, kind of name it and claim it and blab it and grab it, that's not about God. That becomes about us. It's just basically sanctifying and baptizing our selfishness. And that's not the way God works. God's not here to serve us. We are here to serve and honor God. So God is mostly concerned with our spiritual needs, our salvation, our sanctification. But in that process, God often does provide for us physically. The Bible puts a pretty, pretty low standard on where we should be content when it comes to our physical things. The Bible says if you have food and clothes, therewith to be content. That we can be content in Christ with far less than we think we need to be content. The Apostle Paul here faced a lot of need, but he was still content. Jesus Himself faced a lot of shortcomings, but he was still content. We learn here that <clears throat> the spiritual things, thank you, Tommy, give me some water, aren't you, brother? Yeah. I need a lot of adult supervision. <laughs> Tommy takes good care of me. All right. <clears throat> I'm frog in my throat. Hold on one second, guys. 
I'll try to clear it out the whole time we're singing. I could not get it out. All right, here we go. So uh, where was I at? Uh, verse 33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? Friends, I want you to know that we are the elect of God. Amen. That nobody should have to come and say, I can't be saved because I am not the elect. We recognize that we don't know the other side of God's perspective. We only see the doorway of salvation that says, For whosoever shall may come. And those by faith who step through that door can look back and say, You were one of the elect of God. We will not know that in our perspective. It's above our pay grade. But I know this. I can say it this way. I believe that everybody is elect, but just as a political figure has to take the oath for office, we do as well. You might be elect by God, but for you to be saved, you've got to raise that right hand, so to speak, and say, I am trusting in Jesus Christ. I am ready to live for Him as my Lord and the Master of my life. That's how you enter into the family of God. It is God who justifies. Who is He who condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. We recognize that the crucifixion is the centerpiece of Christianity. Without the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross, we would still be in our sins. But the resurrection is equally as important. There were many who died on a Roman cross, but only Jesus could victoriously rise again. Our salvation has a period with the crucifixion, but an exclamation mark with the resurrection. Jesus paid the penalty for our sin on the cross, but He rose again. He gave us the gift of eternal life. We must never forget as Jesus' death burial and resurrection Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 is the basic definition and description of the gospel the good news of Jesus Christ who is even at the right hand of God the Father who also makes intercession for us Jesus did a mighty work 2,000 years ago living a perfect sinless life, dying on the cross, rising again, ascending into heaven, but His ministry did not stop there. Today, even as we speak now, Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father praying for us. He is making intercession for us. That He is praying, first of all, if you are not yet a born-again Christian, He is praying that you will. That you will listen to the external call and the internal call of the Holy Spirit and you'll say yes to Jesus today. He will not force you. He will not make you. But He is providing salvation possible and He is praying that you will have the faith to respond. Amen? And if you are a Christian, you are on Jesus' prayer list. He is praying that you will live a victorious, overcoming Christian life. Not living under your circumstances, but being able to glorify God through them. That He's got a plan and a purpose for every one of our lives. That He has a why for us. And He is praying that we find that and that we live that out. Not in our own intellect, not in our own strength, not in our own resources, but by His grace and His Holy Spirit and the Word of God and the people of God around us. He is praying for us. I am glad that you pray for me and I pray for you, but I'm even more glad that Jesus prays for me. Amen? Are you glad Jesus prays for you? Amen. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword as it is written? For your sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all things, not some things, not most things, but in all things, we are more than, everyone say, conquerors. conquerors. Through Him who loved us, for I am persuaded 
that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, deep breath, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. These are the very words of God from the book that we love. All right, these final verses in chapter 8 are some of the most beautiful in all of Scripture. They have been called by some Bible scholars and commentators the Christian's Triumph Psalm. And because I'm not very creative, I just stole and borrowed that title. Our sermon today is called the Christian's Triumph Psalm. The emphasis in this song, in this last section, is the security of the believer. We live in a world where there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of things that does not cause us to have security, but it causes us to feel insecure. We feel worried. We feel overwhelmed. We feel stressed. Well, God wants to bring a reminder to us today about the security we have, not in our jobs, not in our families, not in our health, not in our finances, but the security that we have in God. Amen? Charles Ryrie. He gave us an illustration to think through this. And today is Memorial Day weekend. I believe a lot of the pools are opening up. Some of you will be in some water here pretty soon. And if you've got a pool, invite me and my family. Amen. Our little kiddie pool is just not going to work. But I've got a sermon illustration that will think through the pool analogy today. A three-year-old felt secure in his father's arms. A dad stood in the middle of the pool. But when the dad, for just fun, began to walk slowly toward the the deeper end while gently chanting and playing with the boy deeper and deeper and deeper. As the water rose higher and higher on the child, the lad's face registered with increased degrees of panic as he held on more tightly to the father, who, of course, easily touched the bottom of the pool. Had the little boy been able to analyze the situation, he would have realized there was no real reason for his increased anxiety. The water's depth in any part of the pool was over his head, even in the shallowest part. Had he been uh, not been held up, he would have drowned. His safety anywhere in the pool depended not on himself, but upon his father. At various points in our lives, all of us feel we are getting in the deep end. We feel like life is about to overcome us, that we're about to drown, the problems will abound, a job is lost, someone dies, we're struggling in addiction, the list could go on and on. Our temptation is to panic, for we feel we've lost control. Yet as with the child in the pool, the truth is we've never really been in control of the most important things in our life. We've always been held up by the grace of God, our Father, that does not change. God is never out of His death, and therefore we're safe when we're going deeper and deeper and deeper as than we've ever been before. You see the analogy? That we, as the children that are drowning or in danger, must grab tighter to our Heavenly Father. That we need to grab a hold even tighter around the neck of the One who has the sure footing and the sure foundation. We don't have to experience the trembling and the fear that this little child has because we can be reminded today of the triumph song that though we are in danger when it comes to our own resources with God we are safe amen this is the triumphant song we want to learn about today Paul in this passage asks five questions these are really rhetorical questions We know that chapter 8 is the midpoint in the book of Romans. Romans has 16 chapters in it. Today we're closing out chapter 8. So in a sense, this is our midterm exam. Amen? We're going to look at the midterm exam 
five questions to see if we are singing this song of triumph or if we will find ourselves in despair and fear today. So in your outline inside your worship bulletin, number one, God is our protector. God is our protector. Verse 31 says this, If God is for us, and that word if could be translated since. This is not a question. Is God for us or not? This is saying because since God is for us, who can be against us? It's saying that if God is for us, it really doesn't matter who's against us because we are on the winning side. Amen? One plus God is always the majority. That we want to stand with God even if everybody else is bowing to compromise, bowing to sin, bowing to fear, bowing to the world, bowing to the devil. We want to stand with God because if God is for us and He is, who can be against us? The problem is in our flesh and in our lack of faith, we struggle in this area. In Genesis 42, verse 36, we hear these words. Jacob, their father, said to them, You have bereaved me. He's talking to his brothers. or uh, uh, Jacob's talking to his sons. They come back from their first trip to Egypt. They come back. Remember, they had sold uh, Joseph into slavery. He's now the second in command. Uh, but Jacob doesn't know that yet. Neither do the brothers. But they come back and Jacob says this, You have bereaved me. Joseph is no more. He thought Joseph was dead. Simeon is no more. Joseph had asked in a clandestine way for Simeon to remain while the rest of the brothers went back to get their youngest brother, Benjamin. And then he says, Jacob says, you want to now take Benjamin with you. Surely his lot will be the same. I will lose him as well. And here's what Jacob says. All these things are against me. You ever felt that way before? When you look at your circumstances, you look at your predicaments, when you look at the people around you, when you look at your ineptitude, when you look at a difficult boss, when you look at the world, you say all these things are against me. What I want you to hear today, based on the authority of God's Word, that life may be hard right now, but God is still good. That God is protecting us. God is for us. That God is not against us. Psalms 118.6 says this, The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now I can't argue with the psalmist. This is a biblical principle. He says the Lord is on my side. But I can tell you this, I'm not really so concerned with the Lord being on my side. I want to be on the Lord's side. Amen. I want to find where God is, where He stands, what He says is true and right, and that's where I want to be. Friends, I can tell you this, that we are under God's umbrella of protection whenever we are doing things God's way. When we order our life according to God's plans and principles, it doesn't mean that life will be easy. You'll face the same adversities, but you can face them with a different resource, a different ability because you're being empowered by the Spirit of God. But I can tell you this, the moment you stop going God's way, you will take yourself outside from underneath the umbrella of God's protection. And God will use circumstances and consequences to get your attention. God doesn't have to directly punish you. Our punishment as Christians was placed upon Jesus on the cross. We'll learn later that there's no condemnation for us, us who are in Jesus. So when we are facing the consequence of life, we need to recognize that we may have taken ourselves out from underneath the umbrella of God's protection and God's allowing those consequences as a good thing to draw us back close to Him. Amen? Yes. J.I. Packer says this, the simple statement, God is for us, is in truth one of the richest and weightiest utterances that the Bible contains. So I don't want you to miss the general big picture principle. 
Some of us spend a lot of time trying to pick apart the nuances of Scripture. We want to dig down into the weeds and that's good and right and okay, but we never want to get lost on the big main points that God wants us to see. Here's what I believe about Bible interpretation. The main things are the plain things, and the plain things are the main things that God's not trying to trick us. God's not really wanting to talk in a riddle to us. That God's not trying to hold things back from us. We want to see the main things that God says and build our lives based upon those principles. This simple statement is, God is for you. If you are a child of God, if you are in the family of God, and anyone says that God no longer loves you, that God's working against you, if you begin to think those thoughts, or a TikTok video begins to cross your feed that makes you question whether God is for you, stop yourself and say, that's a lie from the pit of hell. In God's Word, in Romans chapter 8, says, God is for me. Now, why is He for us? Another simple statement. Because He loves us. God doesn't love us because we're lovable or lovely. God doesn't love us because we're all that special or valuable. Love, God loves us because it's His character to love us. God loves those who are not yet Christians. God loves those who are actively rebelling against Him. He hates their sin, but He loves them. They're His creations. And once you enter into the family of God, you are loved by your Heavenly Father. It's an unconditional love. It's a love that He'll never revoke. It's a love He'll never take away. It's not based upon your goodness or your behavior. He loves you because He has chosen to love you. Karl Barth was a 20th century Swiss German theologian. Not all of his theology and writing is really good. He's what's called a neo-orthodox. That means that he had some things that appear to be orthodox or aligned right, but he had little tweaks on it that lighted confusion. So not everything he said was right, but he said a lot of good things. And I like to believe you can eat the meat and throw the bones away. Amen. But Karl Barr would travel the world and do lectures and seminars and teach uh, students of theology and, and on campuses. Well, one time in the 20th century, he was speaking at the University of Chicago in a Q&A time full of students and faculty. And one student asked Professor Barr a simple question. He said, summarize for us the deepest theological truth that you've discovered over your many years of studying the Bible and learning theology. Well, Dr. Barth thought for a few seconds and responded this way. He said, the deepest, most profound, most meaningful truth that I've learned over all these years is this. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Amen? Amen. The main things are the plain things. The plain things are the main things. Take this to the bank. God loves you, and God is for you. God doesn't just love us. He also likes us. You know that? God likes you enough that He calls Himself a friend that sticks closer than a brother. That, that God wants to have a relationship with you. He wants you to have a conversation with Him throughout the day. He wants you to partner with Him for your purpose in life. He doesn't just want to be a distant deity. He wants to be a faithful friend in our life. Are you in a friendship, fellowship with the God of the universe? If not, why not? It's what He wants from you and what He wants for you. God doesn't just tolerate us. He rejoices over us. God even loves those who are not lovable or lovely. You know those kind of people. The people it's easy for you to say, I know God loves you, and boy, I'm sure trying. Amen? And guess what? There's some people who say that about you. Amen? And it's those same people that God can rightly say, I love them, and because He loves us, He protects us. Number two, God is our provider. He's our protector and He is our provider. Verse 32, He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him up for us all, how shall He not with Him also freely give us all things? Paul here is making an argument from the greater to the lesser. 
Hold on one second here. All right. <clears throat> Think about it this way. <clears throat> if you were to buy a very expensive watch, gold embossed, diamonds on it, if you buy that expensive watch for your spouse, do you think the jeweler would deny giving you the box to take it home in? Wouldn't make sense. You made the purchase. You bought the beautiful uh, the diamond and gold watch. You paid the price. Would the jeweler now say, no, not going to give you the box to take it home? Or think about it this way. If you were to buy your child a new bicycle for birthday, and we gave the bike to the little boy or little girl, but the tires were flat, would you deny him air to inflate the tire? That make no sense. If you went to the expense and the work of providing the bike, you would certainly do a little bit more to make sure the tires were operational so the child could enjoy the good gift. That's the kind of picture that Paul is painting here. He says, if God did the greatest thing possible, gave his son, there's nothing else good spiritually that God is going to hold out on us. God gave the very best He had. Therefore, it's clear He will not hold out on us. God is not one who is going to try to make things difficult for us. He's trying to help us to become more like Jesus. And when those times of need, God wants us to turn to Him again. He wants to provide for our needs, but not always our greeds. I wonder if Abraham offering his son in the Old Testament was on Paul's mind at this point. So I want you to keep your finger in Romans chapter 8 and flip your Bible back to Genesis chapter 22. <clears throat> it's a lengthy passage, but I want us to look at it here really quickly. Genesis 22, beginning verse 1, says this, Now it came <clears throat> to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. Hey friends, know that all of your life is a trust and a test from God. And everything you have, He's trusting to you to use as a good steward. Here we're going to learn that Abraham's, even his favorite and first son, was a trust from God. And it's also a test. God gives you things or doesn't give you things to test your faith, to build your faith. So you're reliant upon God and not upon secondary or tertiary things that life can produce. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. It's a pretty good response when God speaks to you, amen? Ready to respond, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering to one of the mountains, on one of the mountains, of which I shall tell you. Some people pause here, they criticize the true and living God. They begin to talk poorly about Yahweh. They say, look, your God asked for a child to be sacrificed. That's not the kind of God that I want to serve. The problem is they haven't read far enough yet. You just go down a few more verses, you're going to recognize that God doesn't actually require the sacrifice of this child. He makes a substitute, but He was taking a common practice of that day. The Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and all these uh, people living in the land, this was a common practice. They would sacrifice their children thinking that somehow that would please a false god, a false deity. If they would give something like their child, then God would be bound to give them good farming land and give them victory from their enemies and give them good health. They had a wrong view of God because they were not worshiping the true God. Here God uses that standard of that day, but has a far better plan in store. So Abraham rose early. Don't miss that. He got up early. He could have tried to drag his feet. He could have forgot to set his alarm that day. He could have scheduled something else. He could have got slow in his response to obey God. But I tell you this, delayed obedience is still disobedience. He got up early. He had probably plenty of questions. He probably had a restless night's sleep. But he got up early to do what God called him to do. In the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac, his son, 
And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him that was Mount Moriah. Same area, same mountain chain that later the temple was built on and later that same area in which Jesus eventually died at Calvary or Golgotha. That same area, Mount Moriah. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. Check this out. Faith statement. And we will come back again. Now he didn't understand the concept of resurrection at this point in time. But he understood that God was good. That if God asked for something as profound as this to happen, Abraham was saying, I'm not sure how God is going to do it. But I'm going to trust God somehow, some way. This promised child that God promised to me, Isaac, if He's telling me to kill him, to sacrifice him, somehow God's going to work this out that we're going to come back together. Friends, that is the statement of faith. Faith is not knowing everything. It's saying yes to God even before knowing all the details. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid on Isaac his son. See the picture? Isaac carried the wood. What did Jesus carry when He walked to the cross? The cross beam of the cross, which was made of what? It was made of wood. You see the symbolism. You see the pictures being played out. And He took the fire in His hand and a knife. And the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? What I see there is this. This isn't the first time that Abraham took his son to make a sacrifice. This is the first time that daddy took his son to church. Amen. This was a common practice of their life. Abraham was the father of faith. He was passing that faith on to his child. They had worshipped at the altar many times before. This time was unique though. There was no animal as there had been all the other times. So he said, what's up dad? And Abraham said, my son... God will provide Himself the lamb for a burnt offering. There's another statement of faith. He didn't have a lamb. God said, sacrifice your child. Abraham saying, I, I don't know how this is going to work, but I believe that God will make the provision. And the words He said were no true words ever spoken. Many thousands of years after this, God truly did provide Himself. Jesus the Lamb of God who took away the sin of the world, He provided Himself as a burnt sacrifice, as a sacrifice on the tree. So the two of them went together, and they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac. Don't go too fast. We don't know the exact age of Isaac here, but he wasn't, if we picture in our mind, like a little child, this was like a little six-year-old or eight-year-old walking around. He was probably a young man, at least an older teenager at this point in time. He could have probably whipped his dad. And that's a sobering mindset for parents when a dad says, ah, my son can not whip me. <laughs> that's a wake-up call. At least the boy could have outran his dad, right? But no, he was faithful too. He believed his earthly father. And he was trusting his heavenly father. He bound himself and laid on the altar, upon the wood. And Abraham stretched his hand out and took the knife to slay him. I'm sure this was a hard thing. Things going through his mind. I don't know why I have to do this, God, but I'm going to try to obey you. There was silence at this point in time. The last thing we know that Abraham heard was God said, Sacrifice your son. There was no other audible voices until what's upcoming. But he was being faithful with the last thing he knew God told him to do. But the angel Lord called him from heaven. And Abraham, Abraham, he said, Here I am. And that's probably even a quicker here I am than the first one. Amen. He was waiting. He was hoping that he'd hear an intervention. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, you have respect for God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Dear friends, I want you to know this, that God doesn't want to share our allegiance with anything else, even good things. Did you know that your spouse, your children, good things in life can become idols to you? If you make good things into ultimate things, 
It's painful and God has to bring it to your attention that He has to pry those things out of your hands. So we must live with all things with an open hand, believing everything belongs to God, even our children. We're opening them up for God to use as He sees fit. And Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place, The Lord Will Provide. And it said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Hey, the message of Genesis 22 is very similar to the message we find in Romans chapter 8. But there's one monumental difference between these two stories. Isaac was spared. Jesus was not. Number three. God is our defender. God is our defender. Verse 33. Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? So Paul takes us into a courtroom. Some of you may have grown up watching some Perry Mason or watching Matlock. I watched a lot of Matlock with my mama when I was a kid. There's other court-oriented dramas. We're going into a courtroom setting and the prosecuting attorney is none other than Satan himself. In Revelation 12.10, it tells us that the devil, Satan, is the accuser of the brethren. That He accuses us before God day and night, Revelation says. But we have a good defense attorney. Amen? The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, or 1 John 2, 1, that our advocate stands with us. Jesus is our defense attorney. There is a... A prosecutor, an accuser, the devil bringing the accusations. But we have Jesus who stands in our stead to be able to speak well of us. Just as Satan did with Job, that miraculous uh, book in the Old Testament. He slithers before God and says something like this. God, you can't let that Donovan Stewart into your heaven. Surely you do not want that Donovan Stewart guy to be in right relationship with you. Don't you know what kind of a sinner he is? Don't you know about the rotten thoughts that he has in his mind? Don't you know about the unkind words that proceed from his mouth? God, don't you know about the awful things that he has done and even the bad things that he would like to do if he could? And even the good things that he's left undone. The sad truth is that when Satan says these kind of things about me and about you, he's not wrong. He's saying true things. These accusations are true about us. The Bible says that we're sinners by birth and by choice. That we are natural born sinners. That we don't have a propensity to lean to God, but to lean away from God. But when you are saved, the Bible says God takes your heart of stone and gives you a heart of flesh. The Bible says you become a new creature in Christ. The Bible says you are born again, born from above. The Bible says the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. The Bible says that you are now in Christ Jesus. The Bible says these accusations are true, but because of Jesus Christ, He can stand and say those are true accusations, but they no longer apply to Donovan Stewart or Troy Young or Ch Jeffrey Honchel, or put your name in because we have now been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. Amen. And we received the righteousness of Christ. That should make even a Baptist excited. Amen? Amen. That's some good news. Number four, God is our vindicator. Similar to our last point with a little nuance, but God is our vindicator. Verse 34, who is he who condemns 
Who is he who condemns? This chapter began with verse 1. It says, There is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We learn in this section that we have a vindicator. We are not condemned because we have someone praying for us and His name is Jesus Christ. We learn in this very same chapter both the Spirit in verse 26 and 27 and the Son right here in this passage. They are both praying for us. It, spoke, it speaks about this in Hebrews 7.25. It says that, that Jesus is able to save us to the uttermost to the full, to the complete, for those who are in God through Him, seeing He ever lives to make intercession for us. Hey, I'm glad that you pray for me. I pray for you. But I'm even more glad that Jesus is praying for me. Amen? That's right. You are on the prayer list of Jesus Christ. He is your vindicator. There can be no condemnation because you are safe and secure in the prayers and the intercession and the supplication of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. In Luke 22, 31-32, it says this, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail. Peter was a target of the devil who wanted to sift him like wheat. Don't know exactly what that means, but it sure don't sound good, does he? And I tell you this, Satan wants to sift you like wheat too. He wants to make a mess, a havoc of your life. The thief has come to steal, to kill, and destroy. God only wants what's good for you. The devil only wants what's bad for you. But the good news is we have a vindicator. We have an intercessor that stands between us and the devil. And His name is Jesus Christ. And He is praying for us. And He is protecting us. Finally, number five. <coughs> In our triumph song, number five, God is our keeper. God is our keeper. Verses uh, 38 through 39 can be summarized with one question. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Well, Paul asks who can separate us. He begins talking about a list of things or what's that can separate us. It begins with tribulation and distress, external trials, internal turmoil. There are things in life that can separate our love from God, but it never separates God's love from us. Just like uh, this afternoon, I think a storm is supposed to roll in. Guess what? There will be storm clouds in the sky, but the sun hasn't gone anywhere. Amen? The storm clouds may stand between us seeing the sun and us feeling the warmth of the sun. They have come in, but they're not here to stay. God's love is like the sun. It will continue steadfast. We sometimes allow the clouds and the overhang to take place. We can get ourselves outside of the sunlight, but His sunlight never changes. His love never changes. It's not dependent upon our circumstances around us. I don't know where we ever got the idea as Christians that the Christian life is supposed to be all honey and no bees. We know we must recognize that the Christian life has the same adversities, the same challenges. We probably will escape some of the self-imposed damage. We probably can't escape some of the consequences by living a well-ordered life under God's Word. But we're going to say, face the same things that the world faces in this fallen world. Amen? The Bible says clearly, Jesus said clearly, that he in this world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. But verse 37 says, even in all that adversity, we as Christians are more than conquerors. Literally, super overcomers. God wants His children. If you're saved, that's you. God wants His children to be overcomers, not underachievers. This doesn't mean that He delivers us from everything, but it means He'll deliver us through the challenges of life. Now ask yourself, why did Paul pick these particular items to talk about? Because except for the sword, he had already experienced all of them. And he would soon experience the sword as well. 
This man was not speaking from theology or theory. He was speaking from reality. He was not speaking from a, an abstract way of this probably is the case. No, Paul was one who walked this journey. He was an old veteran of the cross. He faced all the adversities. He would eventually die as a martyr. But he said during all those things, God has loved me. God has protected me. I'll continue to sing the song of triumph because my hope is not in the world. My hope is not in circumstances. My hope is not what happens around me. My hope is in the Lord. A man named Polycarp, one of John's disciples, almost a, almost a peer with the great Apostle Paul, he was ready to die for his faith as well. And he said a profound statement. He said, 86 years I have served Christ and He's never done me wrong. Can you say that? Can you look at your life and say, I've lived how many years I've lived. I've got it wrong many times. I've failed God many times. I've not loved God many times, but He's never failed me. He has never let me down. He has never not loved me. He is my protector. He is my provider. He is my vindicator. He is my keeper. Can you sing the song of triumph? The only way that you can sing that song is to know Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. If you've not come into that relationship with Him yet, today should be that very day. Heads bowed, eyes closed.